uh, interviewing Dr. Monica White for the California Social Welfare Archives. Dr. White earned both a master's and a doctorate in social work at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. She has extensive experience as an educator, researcher, consultant, and administrator. Since the mid-1970s, Dr. White has concentrated her work on coordinating health and community-based service delivery systems for older adults and their families. A nationally recognized author and lecturer in the aging field, Dr. White is the president and chief executive officer of the Center for Healthy Aging in Santa Monica, California, and an adjunct, adjunct professor at the USC Davis School of Gerontology in Los Angeles. In addition, Dr. White is also the president of the California Social Welfare Archives. And today, the purpose of the interview is to include you, Monica, in your important work and your important work into the California Social Welfare Archives. Okay, one of the first questions when I interview is, I ask, what made you decide to go into social work? Ah, <laughs> okay. Social work, um, I think, kind of came to me rather than me um, see seeking it out. I had intended to be an English teacher in high school. That was oh. my, that's what I thought I was going to do um, when I went to college. But during college, while I was in college, I, um, I was working as a secretary at Rosemary Cottage. Oh, uh -huh. you may know the agency. Uh -huh. uh, Rosemary Cottage and full of social workers. And um, I had a lot of encouragement to go into into the field, <clears throat> but I was determined to be a teacher. That's, uh, that's something I've always wanted to do. But they talked me into one of the people there, a social worker named Eldeen Bush. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever knew Eldeen, no. but Eldeen got me to volunteer at the YWCA in Pasadena. Huh and started a long career of volunteering, actually. I call it a career because I did so many different things. Started out with a women's lunch business group that soon was working with kids and interviewing families for camp and so forth. So I had a number of years of uh, volunteering in some capacity or another while I finished my education uh, at uh, Cal State LA. and. Um, and uh, the day after I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I had a life-altering uh, decision to make. <laughs> I had two job offers, literally really? two job really? offers. One was from the YWCA, mm -hmm. would I be their uh, youth services director? Wow. And the second was from Pasadena City College. My would I run their remedial uh, reading um, center? Wow. Which, by the way, when I was at Pasadena City College, I was a, a, te a teacher's assistant in the English department and had actually helped to write the grant that established that, that center. Uh -huh. So it kind of comes back around. And that was the decision I had to make. I felt that I had trained to take the remedial reading. I, I was very interested in that. Uh -huh but that I had uh, all this experience around, um, you know, working with people and so forth. So I just, I looked at it this way. I decided that if, if I took the job at the college and I looked five years ahead, I'd probably still be sitting in the college, in the reading lab, with my bachelor's degree, pretty much uh, stagnant. That, at least that's what it felt like. Uh -huh. But if I took the job with the YWCA, I had this kind of open-ended, I didn't know what would happen. And that really was the beginning of it, because uh, after a while, the, I, I, I won a, a national YWCA scholarship to continue my education anywhere and anything I wanted to in the human services and I at that point I had no hesitation at all. I, I didn't even apply to any other university. I wanted to go to USC and I only wanted to go to 
school social work. Oh, that's wonderful. Long story. <laughs> no, but that's wonderful. <laughs> and and it must have made you feel terrific to be able to come out of school like that and to have two positions yeah, yeah. offered. How flattering. Mm -hmm. Okay, Monica, we talked about the most satisfying, gratifying positions that you held. Uh, what were some of the frustrating uh, positions, some of the frustrations that you experienced in your, your experiences? I think I had a, a couple of uh, frustrations as I went along. One was certainly in the research arena when I discovered that you do all this work and it ends up on the shelf. Uh -huh. uh, and I did have that happen more more than once, and, and it is frustrating in that um, you do your best to find the truth in a way. I don't mean to sound Pollyanna-ish, uh -huh. and um, back it up with documentation and, and research methodology and so forth, and then nobody pays any attention to it. And I think it takes you a while to settle with yourself that that does happen on projects, and it, and it, it did happen. Um, the other is that you don't, in research and evaluation, in hindsight you can see uh -huh. what didn't happen. In hindsight you can see what you were missing. For If I can give an example, in MSSP, after years and millions of dollars um, of, of this research for this major effort across the country, we, at least in California, I don't know how it was in other states, although I think similar, uh, we discovered that what we found out how to do was how to save the federal government money, not necessarily the state. Oh. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's complicated uh -huh. to, uh, to explain why it turned out that way, but just, just the way that it was structured. Uh -huh. uh, and so there was a lot of having to go back and say, is this what we want to do and what, what can redirect this? And there has been work, um, work done in that regard. The other frustration, which perhaps is quite pervasive in my work in aging and continues to this day, is rather major, and that is the inability of the acute care system and the community care system to get together. Mm -hmm. We've done incredible work in coordinating and building some bridges, but I, I, in my mind, I see one of those uh, rope bridges across uh -huh. the water that's uh, very shaky, shaky. Mm -hmm. and and um, unstable, mm -hmm. and I just I don't know what will make that difference. Uh, someday it has to do with reimbursement, with traditional perspectives, with the inability somehow of policy makers, decision makers at a, at a high level uh -huh. uh, to see the extreme importance and necessity for uh, care to be looked at in a much broader way and not just health care. Uh -huh. that, that people have other arenas of need. Uh -huh. Just to get out of bed in the morning and take a bath uh -huh. is just as important to a, an individual who uh -huh. is experiencing that problem uh -huh. as getting medical care. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we haven't solved that problem, and, and it would take you know, many hours to, to even articulate some of the things we may wish to do about that. But it is a continuing frustration and I feel like uh -huh. I have spent 25 years of my life uh -huh. at this point uh -huh. uh, working on that uh -huh. and, and I've worked on it in, in smaller arenas but have had quite a, a number of opportunities to make input at the state, the county, the city levels uh -huh. and, and have been involved in some national activities uh -huh. as well uh -huh. uh, to, to try to make to try and make that integration or at least coordination uh, occur and participate in that. Uh -huh. I'm not in a position to make it happen, but to participate in that direction. In a perfect world, 
<laughs> How would you go about, I mean, what, is it, what are the salient points that you would like to see happen? I, in a perfect world, we would have a, a pot of money uh -huh. that is designated to people's care. Okay, but elaborate on the type of care that you, you're exactly. talking about. Uh, the type of care that I'm talking about is that if you need a heart, uh, cardiac, uh, you know, heart surgery, that, that you could tap that money. And if you were un unable to see the cans at the grocery store shelf, that you could also use that same pot of money and you could tap that money to have someone to escort you to the grocery store and help you. So, or if you need someone to come in and cook meals or do daycare, uh -huh. uh, that that's part of the care that you uh -huh. need uh, just as much as you need uh, medications or a medical procedure. So it's, it's, it's a, of course, it's a wild dream uh -huh. um, because what we have right now is many streams of funding and reimbursement and as long as it's tied to health care or uh -huh. medical care, acute care, uh, or follow-up. I'm going to pick you up and take you somewhere, even if it's to county right. medical. Uh, but if you have uh, trouble putting your clothes on in the morning and so you don't, uh -huh. if you have trouble um, you know, taking a bath or, or cooking something for breakfast, there's nothing to help you. Or carrying your family. Yeah, yeah, or whatever, anything. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a very fragmented system, and in a perfect world, we wouldn't have that. It would be about taking care of people, not A, B, C, mm -hmm. or if you don't, or if you you have to have um, so orange girls. hair, purple yeah. eye, and one leg <laughs> to uh, be eligible for yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't qualify. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's ideally mm -hmm. uh, idealistic to a certain extent, but we could have systems of care mm -hmm. that worked. It wouldn't have to be all or nothing, mm -hmm. but we could have systems systems of care where there are true, truly integrated uh, partners in the community with a hospital and uh, nursing homes and home care, both medical health care, home health and, and non-medical uh, home care where we have organizations and agencies and services within the community, be it legal, mm -hmm. financial, they could work together. It, it really is possible that you cannot tap the, the medical reimbursement. Why should they let it go? No. Whether it's managed care or right. private care, they will not slice that no. pie any no. other way. No. And until we figure out a way to either create a new funding stream uh -huh. for the non-medical care uh -huh. um, or share the funding stream and enlarge it to say uh -huh. this is about caring for human beings, uh -huh. um, we're not we're not going to we're not going to solve that. Non-medical care is funded with what I call exceptions, meaning waiver programs uh -huh. for very specific types of people, usually old, poor, sick, frail, uh -huh. you know, really, uh -huh. really vulnerable. Uh -huh. uh, so you have that exception, which is by legislation, uh -huh. or with a lot of people like myself, major black and blue knees begging for money, uh, you know, from begging for money, mm -hmm. uh, from fundraising and right. donations and writing grants. That is how that whole system is funded. Is part of the problem mm -hmm. that all of these, pro you know, the programs are fragmented? I mean, the money is fragmented. Like different people are taking a little bit from here and a little bit from there. Do you think that there's there are different parts? I mean, different legislation or whatever that has provided for, and it's too fragmented. There's not one core. There's not. We are a categorical system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's legislation and it's accepted that way. Everything is in categories. Now we could talk about the positive 
sides of that uh -huh. because there are many um, people in the field, in ma any of the human services field, who worry that if it was all one, that there would be people, one pot, let's say, uh -huh. there wasn't categories, uh -huh. uh, that there are other problems, that the whole is sometimes less than the parts. Uh -huh. So if we put together money, for instance, as we are doing in California, we're starting to put together um, long-term care populations as a category so that the younger disabled and the elderly uh -huh. are in one pot and uh -huh. that, that is so the that's direction good. that's okay, going. That's but there are many who say, well, there's less money than there used to be when the elderly and the disabled each have their own pot. In other words, together, you always have an uh, economy of scale. Uh -huh. So together, there's less money than Is there used true? to be. Probably because how many people need to run one program uh -huh. and you need more people to run two programs. That's a simple example. Uh -huh. You know, you have two directors and two accountants right. and two secretaries. So it should be cost effective, should to, be have cost one effective one. to have one. But yeah, well, yeah. We, we, this remains to be seen. But this is a direction, though, that we are going. We're going there, but very, very slowly. But we. We write legislation, we write, we write policies, we uh, allocate funds, and we provide services in categories. I, I'd like to give you just a very concrete, brief example. In, at the Center for Healthy Aging, where I am, we have a clinic a health, health program as part. We have mental health and community services as, as well. That's in the clinic. We have a, a wonderful program to, with the state of California, the Department of Health, to screen uh, uh, breast and cervical cancer uh, screening mm -hmm. for women without insurance, with no access to health care. Is this no, just for the elder, elderly? It's for adults. It's for okay. women 50 and older. Okay. Uh, so the money is for screening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have another piece of money that I was able to get uh, for outreach from the Avon Foundation to find the women who need screening. So they don't pay for the screening, which uh -huh. means physical, which means uh -huh. exam, physical uh -huh. examinations, and mammograms. So uh -huh. Avon doesn't pay for that. Avon only pays for the outreach uh -huh. and the state contract only pays for the screening. Now if I if we find a cancer, uh -huh. I have no money. I don't have anything to for the next. Care, but I don't have any the next piece. Oh, that's awesome. Now we find ways. We we beat on the system, uh -huh. and there are pockets of money where, because of the nature of the population, which uh -huh. is uninsured, low income. I mean, uh -huh. no Medicaid, no Medicare, no none of the private insurance, not nothing. So now I have to find people who will treat that cancer surgery, chemo, radiation, whatever, with either no money or I have to find some other pocket of money to pay for that. It's an example. That's a frustration. It's an yeah. example uh -huh. of the fragmentation uh -huh. and the, the categorization that we live with. And all services are like that. In How some frustrating. Form. That, that, that's so. frustrating. <laughs> okay. Um, Was there a social movement that you were involved with that seemed important to you but didn't lead to the goals you wanted to obtain? Could we talk about that or? Well, probably in not not in that uh, in that context. Uh -huh. uh, and the the thing that comes to mind for me immediately <clears throat> is that there was a time that I was very interest interested in the. In, in the blurring of lines between the public and the private sectors. And uh, I, I at one time thought that I would like to do my dissertation on that topic and in fact wrote a brief proposal. Uh, I think I was working with Sam Taylor at the time. And uh, wrote a brief proposal because I was seeing that you know, I had done this work with the contract and how the service sectors were, were inter, intertwining. And I thought that the financing was beginning to intertwine. And in many ways, there's very few private um, 
nonprofit organizations that don't have some public money now, and some of them have much, like Jewish Family Services, right. like Huntington, like, like uh, Alphamed, and so forth. It's a real mix. And uh, I was real interested in that, uh, you know, in, in that trend. But I've ne not been, I've seen it happen, but I, I didn't get to follow that uh, up. And the other one we have mentioned, and I won't repeat it all, which is there was a time that it looked like there really was going to be an effort to integrate um, levels of services like acute uh -huh. and long-term and community uh -huh. care uh -huh. and uh, I was I, I, I was on a, a, a national consortium of, of systems that was uh, piloting new ways of serving providing. people and providing services and pooling <laughs> funds and things and it has not happened. Oh. They're still working on it, but it has not but happened. But how many years have they been working They've on been it? working on it now, going on, I, I think it's going on 10 years. It's the National uh, Chronic Care Consortium, a okay. wonderful organization headquartered in, in Minneapolis um, that I was one of the founding members of that that board and they are, they're doing wonderful work and they're fighting this to try to get it, but it hasn't, it hasn't happened. Okay. And and in the social movements, what successes would you like to talk about? Oh, <clears throat> gosh, I I think um, incredible things have uh, have happened for uh, for the elderly, uh, for caregiving, for um, acknowledgement of. The complexity, I think, of an aging society. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, my attention and, and, and my work has has been in aging, so that's the area that I feel most knowledgeable mm -hmm. about. But the and specifically, it, it sounds like a small piece of it, but specifically the the care case care management, the coordination of services, this whole movement to place responsibility for figuring out what people need and then getting it for them uh -huh. by hook or by crook uh -huh. um, is, has, is being acknowledged because the work itself of case management and so forth, that whole, that whole I, concept of working this way is being funded uh -huh. through you know public, public sector funds. Case management is now the language of it is in in every service piece that you want to look at. It's in hospitals. It's it's not just in aging. Uh -huh. It's in, in mental health. It's in acute care. It's in managed care. It's in, in every senior center and every community organization of any kind, serving kids, serving families. Aging didn't invent it. There's always been something like that around, but the, not to this extent. Yeah. Though. And it's being, it's not really a big social movement, but it is a way uh -huh. to to assure that, that people get services uh -huh. of one kind or another, and it's become the preferred way uh -huh. to bring people and their needs uh, together and it's being supported. It's being supported uh, by by many different um, sources, uh -huh. including public monies, private monies, and fee for services uh -huh. and insurance uh -huh. uh, money. So the acknowledgement it, it's really a response uh -huh. to the fragmentation that somebody has to put it together. So it's a response uh -huh. to the mess. Yeah. <laughs> but somehow out of the mess, <laughs> services are being provided. They are indeed. And that is, that's ama it's amazing. Out it's, of it's, uh -huh. it's amazing. And, and uh, I've not only seen that happen, but actually I've been a part of it. I've been a part mm -hmm. of, because so I have trained thousands of case managers. Uh -huh. I have probably been re responsible for helping, not doing it, but assisting agencies all over the country in developing these kinds of, serve this kind of capacity. It's, it's so itself. Yeah. And I, 
that's really rewarding um, and also, I don't, like I said, I don't know that it's a social movement, but I think the social movement is uh, getting older and figuring out what to do about it, acknowledging that it's happening as a society, mm -hmm. and, um, and developing policies, developing funding streams, developing solutions to the, to the issues mm -hmm. that are associated with an aging population. population. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the questions I was going to ask you, like, what significant changes have you observed since you first began to work and presently? But I think that you've almost answered that, but if you'd like to add to it. I would like to add to it because there is one uh, area that's happening that um, we should keep an eye on. It's going to be very interesting, I think, even to uh, social work. Uh, as as a a profession, uh, and that is the the professionalization of case management. Case managers are from every discipline. They're nurses. They're they're psychologists. They're gerontologists. They're social workers. You know, you they're be, paraprofessionals they're, also. They're paraprofessionals. There are physicians who uh -huh. say they're case uh -huh. managers and and so forth. Uh, and of course, it's big in the private sector. Fee for services, case right. management, very successful businesses. Mm -hmm. But what is happening is that it's becoming professionalized. I call it that. Not everybody calls it that. It, there's there's professional development training, um, you know, continuing education. There are now certific certification that you can get as a case manager or care manager. The language changes, but more or less, there's a tendency to now call it care management. But um, there are now beginnings of degree programs, Which degrees is, in case I think management. It's wonderful. Well, it's it's uh, there are very specific skills and a knowledge set, you know, there are things you have to know how to do mm -hmm. to be a case manager. But it's not as easy as it sounds, and I don't really know, I, it depends what day you ask me. I believe that, you know, whether it's a good thing or not, I think social work is the, without question, the best training you can have, disciplinary, uh, discipline, professional training you can have to be to do the work mm -hmm. because you have the individual, the group, the community perspective mm -hmm. uh, at risk of using a cliche, a holistic mm -hmm. perspective. And you learn in social work, which you do not learn in any other discipline, how to form relationships. Mm -hmm. it's, I call it relationship, trust building 101. You learn about that. Right. You talk about it. It's part of the program. That is, I have not found that to be true in other disciplines. However, there are times when you would want your case manager to be a nurse mm -hmm. because of this setting that you're in. If you're in a hospital, it would be nice uh, to, to have. have that help and, and the, the credibility that the physicians put on a nurse mm -hmm. rather than a social worker. So there is room for many, many of these disciplines. So now if we have someone coming out of um, a liberal arts bachelor's degree and going right into a case management degree, we don't have the clinical grounding or the healthcare grounding. So there are issues about that. But this is happening. Um, we, are, we have research, we have exams. I mean, I myself am the chair mm -hmm. of, uh, of the exam committee of the National Academy for Certified Care Managers. Uh, and we developed an exam and we are certifying people who have uh, certain, uh, that meet criteria for education and experience and become, and we test their knowledge of the case management process and, and ethics and some legal questions and so forth. 
uh, and they get a certificate on top or a credential on top of whatever degree they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that they can go out there, whether they're in a nonprofit or in private practice or in a hospital, say, I'm a certified, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. there's validation mm -hmm. for what they know and what they do. And there are many organizations now, something like 16 or 20 organizations that are credentialing mm -hmm. case managers. Most of them, and here's the interesting part, of the 16 organizations that I know that are credentialing case managers, 15 of them are medical. Oh my. Are nurses, rehab, workers' comp, uh, and you, many of them you have to actually have a license to mm -hmm. even sit for the exam. Ours is community day, so it's a little this is not an ad, but I'm saying there it is again, you know, you mm -hmm. have the same. But is it good, is it not? I don't know, it's something we need to keep our eyes on. Social workers have resisted case management. Why? That's a good question because it's not sitting with someone for 50 minutes and doing therapy. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not... Um, Somehow it seems to be running around the community mm -hmm. uh, and organizing, locating, arranging. It's somehow there's a sense that that's not substantive work, and it is substantive work. But I'm, I, I promise you that uh, we will, as a field, regret this because the nurses, the medical profession, the rehabilitation folks, are on, right on top of this and they are getting paid mm -hmm. uh, increasingly to do this work mm -hmm. and we are going to uh, one day say why do the nurses get all the money mm -hmm. and we really have missed the boat so far as a field most social workers will not do don't want to do and it's not just with aging just in general we all do it in a way but they don't call it that it's very very difficult I hope that that changes and I hope I see gerontology schools, nursing schools, um, even psychology schools, formal schools beginning to offer case management as a, at least the course, at least the content mm -hmm. is creeping in there mm -hmm. and uh, I see very little of that happening. In I, the wonder, of social work. I wonder if part of the reason the social workers are kind of bucking it, is because it's a heavy responsibility. It's a responsibility to find all these services, to coordinate all these services, whereas if they're doing social work, you know, like you said, they're sitting behind a desk and it isn't quite as demanding. Well, it's a good point, but it could be, I think of it differently, it could be that they think they're already doing it. Many social workers will tell you that, oh, we've been doing that for a hundred years. Uh, it's and, and, and certain aspects of it, every human services mm -hmm. discipline does it. Mm -hmm. um, just like every arena, like mental health will tell you, mental health people will tell you that they invented it. Mm -hmm. Nurses will tell you that nursing invent community, public health nursing invented case management. Social workers will tell you that they invented it. My experience is that everybody can claim some part of it. It isn't about who invented it. But everybody thinks they do it. What happened in the arena is that it became systematized and formalized in a way that we had not done in the past. There really is something called, there is a process. And all of us bring a piece uh -huh. to it and how it's done who it's done to where it's done how it gets paid for you know how it's organized and all of that can vary but you know basically there's a core uh -huh. set of tasks that uh, everybody does my experience is that social workers um, think they do it whatever they do they already do it and they don't need another letter behind their name or additional training to do something that they know about. That, that's, my, that's my perspective and my experience. You know, I speak right. literally all over the world on this topic and related topics. 
um, really it's not just only case management or care management, but also all that goes systems building and coordination of services and resources for people in need. I rarely, I've probably spoken maybe three times in, in all these years to social workers. Why? I mean, as a group like NASW or a chapter of NASW. Or, you know, I, I do speak at the schools of social work once in a while. But in terms of any major uh, group, it'll be most, I've spoken much more even to nursing organizations, healthcare, physicians, uh, and then anybody interested in aging. But I'm talking about formalized social work groups are just not, I don't know if they're not interested in this or if it's, uh, older people, which they're also not very interested in. I mean, that's another, another, I, I sound, this has gotten to be a whole frustration talk, <laughs> but, it's, but it's frustrating to me that social workers uh, also don't care as much about older people as I'd like them to. Uh, they love kids and families and, you know, and, and the clinical piece and mental health services, but if very few social workers say, I want to go into, I want to work with older people. They think they're not going to work with older people, and of course, we all are. Uh -huh. We all are in one way or another. If, even if you're working with kids or adolescents or young adults, you're uh -huh. going to run into uh, older people, and I would wish that we had more content in aging. And of course we've tried and, and, and USC has tried. Uh -huh. I've been involved when they had an aging concentration and people didn't sign up. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's anyway, that's those are some of the... Yeah. Um, Okay, I'd like to go back to um, you were talking about uh, case or care management and certification. Um, what changes would you like to see happen? What legislations or bills would you like to see passed to make this effective? Um, the whole of, uh, area of credentialing case management is uh, volatile right now. <laughs> And I have to tell you personally, I have some misgivings about certifying case managers and certainly deg uh, offering degrees in case management because I believe that we need our professional backgrounds. As I said uh -huh. before, it's wonderful to have a clinical background uh -huh. underpinning foundation to do this work. But we are seeing a move toward in some arenas requiring a certification to be a case manager, you can look in the LA Times mm -hmm. and you will see in the ads for nurses mm -hmm. that uh, it will say cert, uh, case management, certified case manager preferred. But certified by whom? Yeah, well that's the thing, certified by whom? There is no one organization or body that uh, certifies. There are many, and you can get a, cert a, a, a cert certificate from the Commission on Rehabilitation, which is there just to certify rehab case managers. There's the um, Commission for, uh, they give out a, the Commission, I, I can't say all the names of them. There's, there are so many of them. Or the National Academy of Certified Care Managers, which I'm a part of. Uh -huh. Um, right now there is no single, it's not a license, it's a certificate, it's a creden a credential can be a license or a certificate. But should it be, but should it but be, should it be a license? A license. Um, and, and legislated by the state. There are state programs, like one of the waiver uh -huh. programs, like our MSSP, uh -huh. that are looking at asking for their for case managers to be certified to work in that program. Mm -hmm. um, it's not legislated yet, but we think 
some of us who are in that arena think that it's coming uh, in one way or another, but I don't think it will ever be a state license because of the um, issues between somebody having an MSW, why do they need to be a certified case manager required? Uh -huh. Someone being a licensed RN uh -huh. or a licensed psychologist, should they also be required to have a second license in case management? But isn't it a specialty? It's a specialty in in a way, and that, that's just the issue. Uh -huh. We don't have it worked through. Uh -huh. Should it be, should it not be? I think it can't hurt to say you have certification which shows that you have some core knowledge or some core skills in case management, but you're really coming at this as a social worker or a nurse, and we need both. We need, it isn't either or, we need it all. And that's my, my hesitation to say it should be licensed, it should be legislated. We don't have it worked out. It's an unresolved, it's something we're in the middle of right now. But what we are seeing in legislation is the words case management, funding for case management, and we think probably down the road it, it, there will be some requirements. I will tell you where it is being required. It is being required by some insurance companies and even in long-term care insurance. There, and, and in long-term care insurance there are companies that in order for you to be a case management provider for their enrollees, mm -hmm. they require some kind of certification. Also, there are now about three insurance companies that insure for, uh, that provide the liability insurance for practitioners that are requiring that that practitioner, in order to be insured for liability for case management mm -hmm. services, that they have to have some kind of a certificate to be certified. There are all, there's a, also a whole movement of network building, national networks of case managers who are, so that if you have an aunt in Ottumwa, Iowa, mm -hmm. you can call me up and through my network affiliation, some are formal, some are less formal, but many are very formal, mm -hmm. I would be able to find you a case mm -hmm. manager in Otamwa, uh, but some of the networks, in order to be a member of the network, you have to have be certified. So mm -hmm. those are the directions mm -hmm. that we're seeing that point to something more formal is going mm -hmm. to happen in the future. Well, the case management is uh, is in its really infant stages. In its infancy. Yes. It is. You know, I'm going to ask you, because I think we've covered quite a bit, what you would like to add, you know, in your teachings. I know that's kind of a, an open-ended question, but um, I think that you could teach us and we could learn from your expertise so that if you could add something that we have left out. Okay, sure. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I think what I'd like to add is that we need to convince ourselves, our families, the students that we teach, our colleagues, our friends, uh, and somehow in a broader way our communities that we really are going to be old. For the most part, you know, we, you and I have both experienced people who didn't get to be old. Mm -hmm. But the majority of us will be old, and I say that affectionately, mm -hmm. whatever, old, whatever old is. The statistics are with us. We're going to live a long time. And somehow, we need to be better prepared for aging. We have no preparation in life. Nobody prepares us to be old. And I, and I think often of Genevieve Carter, who used to speak of this quite a bit. And I realized increasingly how right she was. She used to complain 
that nobody ever told her what it was really going to be like, and she lived to be 92 or so. Uh, and she, and, and I used to say to her, Jen, please write this down. Let's write about it. Talk, and I got her a tape recorder so she could talk. I want, I want you to tell us what it is to experience age so we can learn from, from that. And she never did do it, but I think the lesson is there are things to be learned and we have to, uh, you know, to teach each other. I think we just, maybe it's good that we don't worry about it. We shouldn't worry about it, but I think we need to get real about aging. Uh, and you know, we all have role models about people like Francis Feldman, who <laughs> we all want to be that way. <laughs> but for the most part, people ignore it. And in my work, I see it in dramatic ways, the surprise about aging, whether it's yourself or someone in your family. And with 76 million baby boomers coming along, you know, there's Somebody turns 50 every seven seconds. And, you know, there's some. We must do something to prepare people a little bit better, and that that in itself could have tremendous implications for what we have to do for those people who really need a lot of help. That it has a bearing on on the system of care. If we could get people to take responsibility and do some planning. Uh, for getting older, it's going to have some implication about the service system and what needs to be done to take care of people. And I don't have the answer, but it's something I just would like to say that to increase the awareness that we're going to be around for a long time and how are we going to do that and how do we best do that? Monica, how do you prepare for old age? I think that you prepare for old age by first of all um, planning, planning your for a long life. It sounds so obvious and trite, but there are things that need to be considered, uh, and an education, self-education, or education that you can access. You have to think about basically five things. Uh, you have to think about your health, and while there are we all know we get caught by surprise and we get caught with health issues we can't anticipate. There's a lot of things we can anticipate by knowing about our family histories, by doing the things we all know we have to do, and you know the donuts we shouldn't eat and so forth. We, we can think about because I have to take care of myself. Um, so that seems simple. It's not. It, it's something you have to work at. We have to think about our finances. Most of us are not going to be rich. Most of us are not going to have a lot of money. But we still have to somehow survive financially. Uh, so it's not about everybody being millionaires when they, as they age, but it is about saying, uh, I do have to figure out how I'm going to live after I don't, you know. And so it's about budgeting and financing and planning for that. Um, we all have to think about the legal things. We have to think about what's valuable to us in two ways. One, our material things, and I always say, you know, even if it's a, your grandmother's favorite ring, you ought to just write down what needs to, what you want done with it. Um, and it's also what's valuable to us in terms of our preferences and what we care about, and having someone that you could trust and who you designate to take care of you. Um, there's a whole legal arena that, that you can plan for, and you can do it any time. It's not really about age. Mm -hmm. It's about, God forbid, you can get into a car accident any time and suddenly find yourself incapacitated mm -hmm. and have to make the same decisions that someone who you know, is much older has to do. And you can always change those things, and you should, in fact, review those things. So it's about health, it's about money, it's about the legal aspects of protecting your interests, mm -hmm. material or personal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about housing. Everybody wants to, how, where are you going to live? Everybody says they want to stay at home, but it's inappropriate for some people 
to live in the place where they've always lived. Mm -hmm. And there are so many housing options that it wouldn't hurt for people to begin to think about alternatives or at least know about them. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to stay at home, mm -hmm. then the home needs to be a place where they can not only live but where they can die. And that takes a lot of planning and preparation and thinking about it and so forth. And then finally, you really have to think about your support system. And it could be family, it could be friends, it could be an organization, but the connections, to be connected to someone and to plan those connections. Now, if you and I have no connections, but to people our own age, we could be very lonely at 100, and we could be very alone. We need to connect with a variety of ages and people, and that doesn't just happen. That takes an awareness and a very proactive stance to have younger friends, to have you know, to, to have a, a network of support, and you can plan for that. If nothing else, you can hook up with a community organization, a Jewish Family Services, a Center for Healthy Aging, a religious or spiritual group, but some connection. Mm -hmm. Now, all those things sound maybe simplistic, but they're not. It takes an awareness, a consciousness, and, 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 and an acknowledgement that, you know, I'm going to be around for a long time. Uh, I could be one of the, right now we have almost 60,000 people in the country who are 100 and older, and they're the fastest growing population in our country. Wow. <laughs> That's the good news or bad news? <laughs> I don't know. But 50% of them are not in nursing homes. That's wonderful. You know, uh, I mean, hundred and older, and they're not in nursing right. homes. Right. They they might be living with family, or they might be in a you know, I'm not saying they're in a single swinging apartment complex, mm -hmm. but they're out there in the community, <clears throat> and that's going to be. We can look toward that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to just become more conscious in a positive, mm -hmm. in a positive way, mm -hmm. uh, and when I do focus groups with, with older people in their 80s and their 90s, um, and I say, when do we start talking about aging to people? And there are people who say we ought to start introducing uh, it, it in elementary school. There should be much more exposure to it, not in a bad way, but in, in a good way. In a positive way. So it's an attitude, it's an awareness. And it's some um, very proactive kind of, of uh, activities that one can engage in. Um, and then, you know, life takes its own course. But we can be a little more conscious. And I think as a society, this has to happen. My experience with the baby boomers is they are the worst. Mm -hmm. They are the worst group I have seen in 25 years in the field about denying. Okay. Just the denial. denial. Mm -hmm. They, they, if the first studies are coming out about mm -hmm. the boomers, and um, they, they say you have to have a, a minimum of a million dollars to retire, mm -hmm. but, but as a group, um, a, a small percentage of them have a hundred thousand. You know, I mean, this is just in the uh -huh. study. So anyway, I don't want to get off on that. But that that is how you prepare a little bit. We need more exposure and we need more consciousness, but in a positive way. Uh -huh. We don't want to say, oh, you're going to be old and gray and sick and frail. Because the majority of people 65 and older are just fine. They really manage with the majority. Uh -huh. we're, all, we're talking about roughly 20... 20%, 20 to 25% mm -hmm. who need all this help we've been talking about. At what age would you 65 say? and older, and most of them 65. are 85 and I older. Just, because it seemed to me that the average age of uh, entry into a board and care uh, was 85 when I left 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 85 and older is a real, there's a certain vulnerability that sets in at 85 
we don't know exactly what it is, but mm -hmm. a vulnerability, not a have to, but a, mm -hmm. one gets vulnerable. And uh, so yes, most of the people who are in nursing homes or in institutions of care, residential facilities, are 85 and older. Mm -hmm. But the statistics, we're always looking at 65 and older, which you know. Seems young. It's young. <laughs> the 65-year-old today Seems is young. a very different person than the 65-year-old 20, 50 oh, years absolutely. ago. Absolutely. So absolutely. we are, we need to redefine aging, and we certainly need to redefine um, just our whole perspective of old. Because if aging in your center, and we haven't even touched on your center, <laughs> which I think we really should, okay. I think we need to talk a little bit about uh, the um, your center helping aging. Um, but if you talked about before, previously, about people getting breast screening at your center at the age of 50, and people are living to 100, that's 50 years of being old? I mean, that seems un a little unrealistic. <laughs> yes, that's true. We think 50 is young. Yes, we do. <laughs> now that we've passed 50. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, well, the Center for Healthy Aging used to be called Senior Health and Peer Counseling. And uh, I've been there five years, and that was one of the first things that I advocated for, was to change the name of the agency. It was called Senior Health and Peer Counseling because those were the first services that were begun there in Santa Monica in 1976. Mm -hmm. And so it focused there and in fact it is the premier to this day, the premier organization for senior peer counseling. We still do peer counseling. But it has broadened so dramatically uh, the focus on, on prevention, on health care, on mental health to add not to the peer counseling professional mental health and psychiatric services. And there are also some real gap filling in home and community services that are provided at the center. And I thought with a lot of support from board members and staff that we ought to rename ourselves to reflect uh -huh. better what it is I that we do. Great name. Yeah. And so as I was saying, um, the new name then was not only to as I said, reflect better what we actually do, but to also set a tone for where the direction we need to go is, which, which is that if we're going to age well, we need to, we, we can't start at 65 or 70 or, or 85. I mean, I believe it's never too late, uh -huh. but I think it's never too early. Uh -huh. And while I'm not interested, and neither is the board, or the staff, for that matter, uh, in in beginning to serve young people. That is not our, our goal. I think we do need some services for younger people to begin this process, as I said earlier, raising awareness. You're going to be around a long time. What are changing leaves us wide open to do whatever needs to be done, and I believe that a small organization like the center um, needs to be extraordinarily flexible to change and respond to uh, the different uh, directions that the community goes in, the emerging needs and the issues that come up. Uh, and I just wanted to be able to have a more open uh, venue than say senior health and peer counseling. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was narrow, mm -hmm. narrowing. Mm -hmm. It needed to, it was perfect mm -hmm. for the time mm -hmm. that it was made. It used to be called something else altogether when it first started. Before peer counseling? Yeah, it used to be called the Santa Monica Bay Area 
health screening program for the elderly. I think I have it close. It was something like that, and then a couple of years a later. <laughs> and um, Bernice Bratter, who was my predecessor, and was there for 17 or 18 yeah, years, did a remarkable job of putting this small organization on the map. It was a terrific uh, effort. and. Uh, she did a great job, and it's a wonderful organization. Um, this, the center, because of its size, um, about a $2 million budget, about 35 staff, maybe 125, 50 volunteers, and we usually have about 10 to 12 graduate interns from various schools, psychology, nursing, social work, mm -hmm. gerontology. Uh, relatively small, really cannot do at the hospitals what the major organizations like Jewish Family Services with mm -hmm. 400 staff and right. so forth. We can't really compete in that way, nor can we compete as a, a private nonprofit with a majority of our funding from the private sector mm -hmm. Uh, rather than the public sector. We also can't compete with those organizations, those senior services organizations, that get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars from uh, older Americans money or mm -hmm. the county, you know, the AAA mm -hmm. and, and so forth. We, we can't really fight for those funds. And I, as the head of the agency, am a, a great believer in not duplicating services that already exist mm -hmm. in a community. I would rather work with those other organizations and do what I can to enhance their quality rather mm -hmm. than saying I could do it better and yeah. we're going to do it too. That's my preference. Uh, so our focus is to fill gaps mm -hmm. and to augment the systems that exist to come up with, to create and develop the services that are not being provided, either because others won't, don't, can't, I don't know why, mm -hmm. they're not there, mm -hmm. but they're not there. Can you give an example? Sure. Uh, we're, we have an, uh, a number of these kinds of what I call gap filling, mm -hmm. uh, augmentation, uh, uh, services. One of them clearly is our daily money management um, program. It's not the only one in the world like it, although it has some unique characteristics. Um, it's, a, it's a program where we actually go into a person's home twice a month, pay their bills, open their mail, pay their bills, reconcile their checkbook, um, go through their insurance forms with them, uh, or whatever other kinds of forms they need help with. Uh, and that's because there are people who can't see well enough or who have some other condition. Maybe they're a little bit confused. They can't remember. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> we all could in some ways. Uh, and we do this with volunteers. So it's very cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, it's scary for nonprofits to use volunteers for something like this, but mm -hmm. our model of utilizing volunteers is very, very excellent. Our training and our supervision, our in services, we're really on top of mm -hmm. all our volunteer programs. To mm -hmm. be a volunteer with us, you, you're, you really have lots of rules and regulations and requirements and we we watch everything very closely and we've never had any problems. Uh -huh. um, nobody else does that on the west side, believe it or not, there isn't anyone else who's doing daily money management. We call well, it that's daily kind money of a money. risk I think it's that no one wants to take. It's a risk. Uh -huh. um, so we also have a program uh, here's a little different direction where we provide a professional person who is like a care manager type of person uh, to a major medical group, primary care medical group, um, who is available to them just with a call if they run into someone 
who they're doing all the medical things, but someone in the office recognizes that this person may need something non-medical. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a nurse, it could be the office manager, it could be uh, it could be a physician. They can call us, and this person is available to the patient to make the, the links to the non-medical community system of services. Uh, that's a real gap filler. Mm -hmm. We're augmenting health care. We're augmenting mm -hmm. the physician office. It's a wonderful project. Mm -hmm. We have others like that, but that's a project that was developed at Huntington, one of the one of the projects that we created and developed there, and then I'm, I've adapted to and fit into this, mm -hmm. uh, this community. Uh, we also have a pro another example of that, a program where we um, work with retired nurses and they actually um, help to manage medications for homebound uh -huh. people who may have a whole range of other services but somehow they can't, they're not doing well with their meds uh -huh. and these volunteer retired nurses under our program go into the home and figure out what to do about it uh -huh. and to help the, the person or the family or whoever to to mm -hmm. organize to make the medications work because it's such a risky it's such a, a, a risky thing not to be able to take your meds right and right. we work with the physicians and the pharmacists mm -hmm. whatever is needed so you know if we go on mm -hmm. those are a couple of examples mm -hmm. but that's the direction that I think we need to go in and that has served as well is mm -hmm. to look for the gaps and to address them. Of course, we have to find the money, write grants, beg and plead, but you know, we, we, we do it. And you've done a beautiful job. Thank you. Monica, I want to thank you. I think that you're fantastic. Yes. I'm really impressed. And not only that, but I'm preparing for my good <laughs> for my aging because I don't believe I'm old yet. Oh, <laughs> but but old I've learned good. a lot, yes. and um, and I think that anyone listening to or reading about your interview will also learn a, a lot. And uh, I thank you profusely. And now that you've really uh, closed the interview, I would like to add one small oh, thing. Oh, good, good. I'm sorry, I just, just okay. I don't want this interview to go by and not say this. I do a lot of writing, as you've seen from my resume. And I just want to say that I think it's critical, it's essential for people who work in the field uh -huh to write and to contribute to the literature, mm -hmm. to the professional literature. I think, right. I think it's critical and I would encourage mm -hmm. uh, people who are not in academia mm -hmm. to write. Absolutely, so yeah. it doesn't get lost. That's right, and there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot that we can contribute. I've written from the academic side, but I think it's important for people in the field uh, to write, so I want well, your to, I list want to of publications <laughs> is really impressive, along with everything else. Thanks. Thank you once again.